Welcome again as we continue looking at Peter's instructions about family and relationships. Um, you know, it's, it's important for us to understand that the basis upon which we learn to have healthy relationships begins within our own family. And that children grow up watching the relationship of a husband and wife, a mother and father, and that becomes for them the template of what makes for a healthy relationship. Uh, there are things that can impact that negatively, but it's really, really important important. And I would say some of the most recent research is kind of shocking because we're finding that the most important uh, impact upon the development of the character of a young person is the relationship they have with their fathers. Young men and young women who feel loved and cared for and who feel like they can rely upon their fathers for provision and protection and helping them to fulfill what is in their best interests uh, generally turn out better than kids who grow up without a father. And so this is kind of the disastrous dynamic of our culture because we find that any given moment in time that one quarter of young people in our society grow up without a reliable father figure in their life. And if they don't find a surrogate, they're going to struggle to develop their, their personality. It's not impossible. But this is why it's so important, I think, that young people, single moms, if I'm speaking to you and you have kids at home, that they are allowed to begin to identify uh, examples of godly men within your own church, your own church community. That's essential. And uh, I know that sometimes this becomes scary because we have this whole predatorial dynamic in our culture as well, where there are those creepy guys who are going around with uh, pretty twisted concepts about love and sex and fulfillment. I get all of that. and You need to be doubly on your guard. But at the same time, I think it's important that you understand that uh, even looking at the pastor of your church as being a role model in terms of his marriage and his family, his relationship with his wife, that becomes something that young people can focus on and say, you know, this is what I want to be. So it's not even absolutely necessary that a dad is in the home. It's just that there's a man figure in their life. They can say, this is a person I want to be. And this is why I find it so disastrous when pastors fall into sin and immorality and their marriages go south. And I, I, I don't want to get, digress into that because it's, it's actually personally, I've seen it happen and known so many men to whom it's happened that it's so painful personally for me to even think about it. But nonetheless, uh, it is so terrible when it happens. And that's why I think, you know, we look at people and say, what is their track record? You know, I don't, uh, I don't have trouble saying to people, you know, follow the role or example of my wife and I. We've been married for 54 years going on. We've just started into our 55th year. Um, and the whole point is that we haven't been perfect and we've had our highs and lows and ups and downs. That's why I'm able to talk about so many things. But it's important to understand that it's our responsibility as spiritual leaders. And this applies to the pastors, the elders, uh, the staff on the church, the deacons, even the ushers, that we're seeking to be an example of what a godly man is. Because there are young people who don't have that in their life. And we can become that just by the way we live out our life and we interact with them. That's why one of the greatest challenges we have is to get men involved in the children's ministry because even the teachers have told me, it's such a difference when a man is in the classroom. The kids behave differently because they're yearning for that male role example. And you have young boys who oftentimes will act out because they find that missing. But when they have somebody they can look at, a teacher in that classroom who is really an example of what they would like to have, maybe they're not going to have that father at this point in their life, but they can grow up to be that father because they had an example lived out in front of their eyes as they grew up into the church and in the community. And also, it's interesting that research has found that kids who grow up in churches usually are much more successful in life, and for an interesting reason. They have a network which helps them to make it into schools and, and trade schools and into academia and into professional careers. In other words, most kids who are successful know somebody who knows somebody and who speaks on their behalf, who vouches for them. And so becoming integrated into those kind of relationships, if you're a single mom, is essential for the welfare of your kids because those kids will not only again see this male role model, but they'll also 
develop relationships with other mature individuals who allows them to become networked into the society that can help them to get a leg up. So many young men I talk to where they're in some kind of, they're a plumber, or electrician or whatever thing. They got into that because somebody in the church said, well, you need a job? Hey, I'll teach you how to do it. And they took him under their their wing. And basically, as one guy used to put it me, they get a little bit of man smell on them. And it makes all the difference in the world. I know for you ladies, that's not an attractive illustration. But, you know, it's something that's very, very uh, important to every young man. But Again, coming back to what Paul says, he says, rather than seeking that external evidence that you're worthwhile or lovable or valuable, look at nurturing that inner self. And this is a hard habit to break because most people spend so much time working about their outer shell, their external, external presentation, that they spend very little time developing who they are on the inside. And this is why I'm saying the most important thing we can do is spending time every day. For me, it's best to do it in the morning. If you are one of those people who has to be at work like four in the morning or something like that, I get the dynamic. But find a time during the day. When I was a, a young Christian, I had to work all the time. I used to use my lunch hour uh, to, to read my Bible and to pray and spend time with the Lord. Um, and it was interesting because my coworkers began to look at me and go, why are you doing that? And I would be able to share the gospel with them. Uh, didn't mean they all came to Christ, but they all you know, took note of it. And they started watching my life and how I lived when they saw how hard I worked and how faithful I was and how submissive I was to the leadership. Um, they started liking me and then they started offering me jobs that I couldn't take because I wasn't able to have permanent employment. But that's another story. The bottom line was that there's this inner beauty that we can develop. And the thing I love what Peter says in verse 4 is it's an unfading beauty. You see, all beauty fades. We all know this. We all understand that. That's why people are terrified with growing old. And so we don't want it to fade, and we're trying to extend it as long as we can. Truth of the matter is, it, there's, there's, a, there's a tipping point where there's nothing you can do about it biologically, it just isn't possible any longer. And that's why you have people thinking about transhumanism and being in transport their mind into some kind of object or to have basically, you know, the bionics and all those kinds of things, because they're terrified of the eventuality of growing old and becoming weaker and less capable. Let me tell you, as somebody who is growing older, getting weaker and becoming less capable, <laughs> I get it. And yet at the same time, I wouldn't trade the wisdom that God has granted to me for any of the strength or capacity of youth. Yeah, I can't run fast, but I can think a lot faster and a lot more clearly. Uh, as that old saying goes, you've probably heard a thousand times, that when my uh, face finally cleared up, my mind began to go fuzzy. Well, I find that not really true. I find that as our we get older, our mind begins to get much more sharp. We may not remember details or learn things even as quickly, but we know things more deeply. And we have a much deeper understanding of things than we did when we were younger. But he's interesting. He defines what that unfading beauty that we should pursuing is. He says, first, it's a gentle and quiet spirit. Gentle means that there's a mildness in your disposition, that you're, it's this inherent quality that you're not, you're not pugilistic, you're not argumentative, you're not anxious, you're not coming back at people, you're not, it's really kind of the opposite of self-assertiveness. Now there's a balance here. We need to be assertive at times. We need to be able to speak up for ourselves and for others, and we need to speak up for God. And, I, and I, that kind of assertiveness, if you will, is healthy. But when there's self-assertiveness, basically this drive to just push myself forward with self-interest, that is always unhealthy because you threaten other people when you do that. You become a threat to them because they're, they're saying to you very clearly, I don't really care about you. I don't care what happens to you. I just want what I want and I want it right now. And he said, that's the opposite of this idea of gentleness, because the gentleness means that there's a trust in God's goodness and the fact that he's in control of every situation. And you're not, you don't get overwrought by difficulties, but rather you say calm in the face of the storm. And then secondly, he talks about a quiet spirit. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't talk. What it means is inner tranquility. Again, 
It doesn't mean you're, you know, somebody says, well, you're too verbal. Well, maybe you are. If you are too verbal, then you could focus on that. But the problem is most people is they're not verbal enough. And when they do speak, they speak with an aggressiveness and assertiveness and almost like we have to get mad enough to tell people what we really think or feel. But this is the idea that there's you're so certain and secure in your relationship with God that you can speak the truth and you can do it in a loving way and you don't have to attack the other person. These are hard things when you live in a highly superficial culture. The narrative is superficial, but we're called to be people not of superficiality. We're called to be people of substance. And that's something we should be working on every day, our entire lives. And I trust that the reason why you're listening to me as I babble on is because that's your desire as well. Well, I'll pray for you and you pray for me and hopefully we'll be, get a lot of this stuff figured out as we go along and become more effective for Jesus. Better husbands, better wives, better moms, better dads, better kids. We can be, become better citizens within our community and society, and we can make a difference in our own time. Blessings, go in His grace.